A very good evening to all present here. This is Dr. Reddy Shekhar Reddy. On behalf of Eltoy India, I welcome you all to this session of webinar, I mean the 90th webinar in the Eltoy webinar series. Uh, this evening we have with us uh, Dr. Megha Juneja from United States of America as a resource person. And we have uh, Dr. Ashok from Eltai Pune chapter to moderate the session. And I welcome the resource person and the moderator and all the office bearers of Eltai and each and every one of you, the participants from different corners of the country as well as different parts of the globe. It is a warm welcome on behalf of Eltai to you all. Before moving on to the session, uh, let us have watch the video about Eltoy, a short video about Eltoy. Thank you all for watching the video about Eltoy. I take the opportunity to welcome you all this evening for the 90th webinar in the Eltoy webinar series this evening. I welcome today's resource person, Ms. Megha Juneja, who is working as a 
Training and Model um, Implementation Manager in the Purdue Polytechnic High School, Indianapolis, United States of America. Welcome you, ma'am, to this uh, evening for the session. And I welcome Dr. Ashok from Pune chapter, who is about to moderate the session. I take the opportunity to welcome each and every one of you from different corners of the country, as well as the globe, uh, who are present here to attend the session, webinar session today evening. I mean, today we have uh, um, what is called pleased to have uh, doc, I mean, uh, Dr. Mega Ma'am as resource person on the topic, human-centered design to problem solving one of the most sought topic in the present day. And I welcome moderator Dr. Ashok from El Pune chapter to moderate the session. Dr. Ashok, over to you. Before that, uh, a few announcements to the participants. Dear participants, at the end, you can, you can uh, uh, post your questions in the chat box uh, if you want any queries uh, uh, towards the speaker to get clarification. And during the question and answer session, we will be sharing with you separate links for LTI members and non I mean students as well as the participants from abroad. You have to use the specific link to fill your details to get the certificate. And uh, I welcome uh, the moderator, Dr. Ashok. Over to you, Ashok. You can introduce the speaker and take over the session forward. Thank you. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, Megha, uh, am I audible to you now? Yes, you are. Technical yeah. glitch. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Reddy, for this uh, welcome and introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to moderate the session. A warm good evening to everyone present here today. I, on the behalf of Elta India and the Pune chapter, feel privileged to welcome our expert speaker, Megha Juneja and all the esteemed dignitaries and members in the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, Megha is going to talk about human-centered design to problem solving. Megha has been in the education sector for about 15 years now in uh, various capacities, a trained and experienced educator. Her work has been, uh, her work has given her the opportunity to work with learners, young, and adults from all walks of life within and outside of the Indian subcontinent. Currently, she is uh, the model implementation manager at Purdue Polytechnic High School, PPHS, where their mission is to reinvent high school and prepare students for jobs that don't even exist yet. At PPHS, she has been the EL specialist, personal learning coach with a communication focus. And she has also the district reading specialist trained in the Autumn Gillingham reading methodology. She works at identifying great partnership for her school that helps students solve complex problems using the design thinking pedagogy. Since having relocated uh, to the US in 2013, she has worked in varying capacities she is certified TESOL trainer from Teacher College, Columbia University, New York. For the first three years, she worked as an educational consultant on multiple projects. She was an instructor with high level learning as a freelance editor and content creator. She prepared and revised content for English textbooks for reputed publishing houses. She also tutored online linguistics, education, and ESL students from across the globe and tried to keep alive her passion for working with uh, socially impactful organization by publishing articles as the founder editor of impactpreneurs.com. Here, she tried to highlight the work and initiatives in India that are trying to bring a sort of social and economic revolution through their work. Dear ladies and gentlemen, Megha will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes from now. And soon after that, we will have Q&A session. I request esteemed members in the audience to put their questions in the chat box, which you can see on your screen. We are delighted and privileged to have Megha Juneja with us. We welcome her at this webinar. We look forward to listening to her. 
without further ado, I hand over the floor to Mega. Thank you. Over to you, Mega. Thank you, Ashok, and thank you, Dr. Reddy. Um, good morning to everybody on my side of the world, on my side of the world, and good evening to everybody uh, in India and in the in the Asian in the Indian subcontinent, I should say. So my name is Mega, and I think Ashok has given um, given us all a little brief into a little bit of what I do, uh, what I've done in my life. I am privileged to be here. I feel absolutely uh, thrilled talking to people um, <clears throat> from from my alma mater. Some of you are, I think a lot of you are from where I am. Uh, you've been to places, you've lived, or you are you work in places that I, I've been um, moving on. Um, here's something about me. Um, I, I was born and raised in Delhi. I studied in Hyderabad. I worked in Mumbai and Pune. Uh, our, our lives brought us here to US. It wasn't me. It was my husband's job that brought us here. Um, and I live, have, I lived in New York City for a little while. That was also when I got my TESOL certification. And at the moment, I work I, I work as a model implementation manager and training support at Purdue Polytechnic High School. Um, I, I am proud to say that I helped start the school. Um, I have been with the school even before the school was there. So I am one of the founding, found, founding uh, team members and I feel really proud saying that when we started the school, we started out in one room and today we are three schools across the state of Indiana and I work with all three of our schools. Um, there's there's a picture of me, my husband and my son. I have a six year old and the picture that is here, this is how I think he thinks I look. So I think it's important. It's it's important for me to to see myself from his eyes. So I would also, I also very proudly say that I'm a I'm a proud mom to a six-year-old who's a first time, so who's just started attending public schools. So I'm a public school parent here. Public school um, in India, the equivalent would be government schools. So all kids here go to public schools and I see there's there are lots of challenges when it comes to education and public school. And some of those challenges are similar to what we face um, back home in India as well. Um, Nothing's perfect. Sitting in India, I always thought the world in the U.S., this education schools here would be perfect, but they're not. So the mission at our school is to reinvent high school and reinvent experiences for our students and uh, prepare them for jobs that don't exist. That's something like even if you wake me up in the middle of the night and you ask me, what are you doing? I would say helping prepare kids for jobs that don't exist yet. It feels pretty lofty of a goal, but I think we need to do that because the world is changing at a pace that um, none of us can even imagine at the moment. Uh, the way it's changing, the way the job market's changing, I don't, and our education system is still catering to uh, the industrial ages when we needed labor, when we needed people um, to do the jobs that the economy of then needed. So moving on with that mission in mind, I think the one of the biggest tools that I have acquired over my work life here is design thinking. And I would love to share that with you. When I say human-centered design, design thinking is at the core of human-centered design. And and what happens here is it's if you if you just google design thinking you will come across um i can i can easily say about 50 to 100 or maybe even more models of design thinking each person does it in their own style each company each organization each of each school university you'll see they have their own method uh, their own process of teaching and implementing but this is where it all started. So these five hexagons that you see are 
where it started out. Idea of um, the school at Stanford University, uh, design school, those were the pioneers. So I would go back to the source, go back to the original uh, creators and uh, of design thinking and use these five steps as the starting point. Uh, design thinking is nothing but a series of diverge, converge, diverge, converge. So with if you can remember anything from this video, from this uh, presentation, I would say just remember the ideas of constant, divergent, and convergence. Um, you meet people, you interview them, you ask them questions, you go divergent. You come back to one thing, you pick one story, you converge. You diverge again and converge again. So to me, that is the most important aspect of this process, design thinking and design process. Uh, and as we as there's there's lots of theory around this whole idea, but there's a there's a pretty interesting video that I would want that that I'll just play. And that video, it's five minutes. It talks about this redesigning experience. And what they're doing is redesigning of uh, an everyday experience. Um, shopping cart, trolley, shopping trolley, whatever you call it, that's what they're trying to redesign for a better usage. Let's watch the video and then we'll see you back here. We went to IDEO, the product design folk, and said, take something old and familiar, like, say, the shopping cart, and completely redesign it for us in just five days. ABC News correspondent Jack Smith tells us what happened next. Nine in the morning, day one, and these people have a deadline to meet. So welcome to the kickoff of the shopping cart project. This is Palo Alto, California, in the heart of Silicon Valley. And these are designers at IDEO, probably the most influential product development firm in the world. Safety emerges early as an important issue. 22,000 child injuries a year, which is, and so they're hospitalized injuries. I mean, th there are many others. And theft. It turns out a lot of carts are stolen. As the team works, it becomes clear there are no titles here, no permanent assignments. The other side says, gives us a lot of help, says, be safe. <laughs> I'll give you a big red ball on a, on, a, on, a, on a post, and that says you're a big guy. If you got a ball, you're a senior vice president. You know, what do I care? The desk, the red ball, it's all the same. It's not possible. The team splits into groups to find out firsthand what the people who use, make, and repair shopping carts really think. Okay, go. The problem with the plastic cart is the wind catches it. Yeah. And these things uh, have been clocked at 35 across the parking lot. <laughs> oh. Man, that's actually a pretty good point. 3.30 in the afternoon, and the group is back at IDEO. There is no let-up. Each team is going to demonstrate and communicate and share everything that they've learned today. A uh, shopping cart has been clocked at 35 miles an hour, traveling through a parking lot in the wind. We were in the store, what, two hours? And, and it was truly frightening just to see the kind of stuff going on. You got to designate some people to make damn sure that the store owner's point of view is represented. After nine straight hours, the team is tired. They call it a day. So, um, Everybody cool? Well, uh, that's great. Thanks a lot. We had a great time today. Yeah. Yeah. IDEO's mantra for innovation is written everywhere. One conversation at a time. Stay focused. Encourage wild ideas. Defer judgment. Build on the ideas of others. The ideas pour out and are posted on the walls. Oh, the blind, the, the privacy blind. Like when you're buying six cases of condoms, you, no one sees. So if it doesn't nest, we don't have a solution. For you. Organized chaos. Uh, it's not organized. Um, what it is is it's focused chaos. Vote with your post-it, not, not with an idea that's cool, but with an idea that's cool and buildable. Um, if, it's, if it's too far out there and it can't be built in a day, then I don't think we should vote on it. Enlightened trial and error succeeds over the planning of lone genius. Enlightened trial and error succeeds over the planning of the lone genius. If anything sums up IDEO's approach, that is it. If you don't work under time constraints, you, you could never get anything done because it's a messy process and go on forever. 
Back at the shop, it is 6 o'clock, and the four mock-ups are ready for showing. Baskets also can be, if you think you will have more volume, baskets can be put in. A modular shopping cart you pile hand baskets onto. A high-tech cart that gets you through the traffic jam at checkout. That you could mount a scanner on the shopping cart so that you as the customer, as you pull it off the shelf, would scan each item. One that's built around child safety, and another that lets shoppers talk to the supermarket staff remotely. Uh, yeah, where can I find the yogurt? But the adults, again, decide more work needs to be done before the mock-ups can be combined into one last prototype. There it is! There it is! <laughs> so we took the best elements out of each prototype. The cart, which is designed to cost about the same as today's carts, is different in every other way. What do you think? <laughs> well, I, I'm very proud of the team. I think it's, it's great. This, does this work for you? Works for me great. Yeah. It's also beautiful. The cart's wheels turn 90 degrees so it can move sideways. No more lifting up the rear in a tight spot. And you shop in a totally different way. The bags are hung on hooks on the cart's frame. Remember, there is no basket here. At yeah. first, I was a little shocked, but I think it's, you have some fantastic ideas here. It needs a little refining, but I think that it's great. I mean, we would, we would want them. She also gave us some really good comments about how we can make this thing better. A lot of hours. Also, an open mind, a boss who demands fresh ideas be quirky and clash with his, a belief that chaos can be constructive, and teamwork, a great deal of teamwork. And these are the recipe for how innovation takes place. This is Jack Smith for Nightline in Palo Alto, California. So, um, let me go back to the slides. Yes. So, um, as we watch this video, this video, and this was a five minute version of a longer video. So if you want to watch this complete video, it's, a, it's absolutely fascinating. I think I've watched this at least 200 times so far. So the idea here is to redesign a shopping cart, an experience that already exists. So design process is while it's here, it's used to redesign a process, a, a product that exists. Design process is also used to problem solve uh, most of the times. And how we teach it at school is different than this shopping cart. We don't give them three, five days to take this existing product and redesign it. We give them challenges that are bigger and beyond them sometimes. So at the moment, the students in my, in my school, one of my schools are working on the idea of feeding 900 feeding 9 billion people by 2050. It looks like, oh my God, how am I? I am 14, I'm 15. How am I supposed to feed 9 billion people by 2050? Um, but the idea is the solution starts with one. So a lot of our students work on the idea of food wastage. They work on the idea of recycling, composting. They're working on something to do with um, like, uh, one of the groups that I was working when I was teaching um, came up with this idea of um, designing an app that can that can tell you when your food is going to go bad. So every time you shop, you get you get all these yogurts and I don't know, like shopping behavior here is I, it has changed for me a little bit than it was in India. So it's a lot of packaged food. And a lot of that has expiry dates. <clears throat> so this the student came up with the idea of an app that will help me identify and like like send me alerts on my phone the moment my yogurt is going to go bad. So and it will send me like some recipes on how to use it. So it was it, it's it's a great design. It's a great idea. And the other group is working on um, the idea of doing a farm. That is that will raise it, it. It might sound ridiculous, but it will it will raise crickets and bugs. Uh, some people do eat bugs, and bugs are supposed to be 
not me, <laughs> but bugs are supposed to be nutritious. And so they were like in, when people like, I don't know how to put it without, without, without disgusting some of you, uh, because I was, I felt disgusted when I heard that, like, I was like, I'm not never going to eat bugs, but people do eat it. And, uh, and for, for the project, these kids tried eating those bugs as well themselves. So because we're talking about feeding 9 billion people, we are a growing population. I think our, um, that is going to be a real challenge, how to still stay nutritious and get hands on with the growing inflation and growing prices of everything. So, yes. So the challenge is like I'm talking about and the one that we saw in IDEO design experience here um, are similar because we follow the approach, we follow this design thinking approach. So when you talk about these five hexagons, the idea is if you look at, if you, if you, if you go back to the video for a bit, the person here, like when they were given the challenge to redesign a shopping cart, they did not just go to the machine, go to the, go back to the factory and start designing it. Where did it all start? It all started out in the field. So they started going, they went with cameras, they went with notebooks, they were observing. So observation and interviewing people and seeing what is it that is wrong, uh, like talking, looking at people putting their kids' um, ch child seat in the, in the shopping cart, which is unsafe, carts running away, from interviewing the store managers, interviewing the people who, who shop, with the shopping cart people who probably even pull those shopping carts and bring them back into the store um, and all of those things. So that is where it's empathy. It's that is the place that is the starting point for designing or even so when you say let's design a shopping cart, you don't you don't just go on your computer, start redesigning it and then go to the factory and build it. It starts with people in mind. It starts with the it starts with the human in mind. So you're not designing a product. You're designing a product for the people. And I think this is where the idea of human centeredness come to play because human is human is at the very core, at the very center of any experience. So let's learn from the human what does that human need? So uh, yes, I would not eat bugs to solve the food problem, but I am sure there's some will. And those, if they eat that and are able to get nutrition, the food can get distributed. It's the same concept of how, why the world, the entire world cannot go vegetarian, the entire world cannot stay non-vegetarian. So non nothing is sustainable, but divide it up and all of us will be taken care of. We, we need all kinds. So when you're designing a solution or an experience for a human, uh, earlier we used to call it, the, the idea was instead of human-centered, you'll also hear the word user-centered. Um, user kind of, de the word user kind of dehumanizes the experience. <coughs> Sorry. So that is why I think the bent is to you to bring the human back and keep the user out. Uh, so user is anyone who's using. But when we say user, we are not thinking of this person. We are thinking of anyone. So when you want to bring, so if you're designing something for, let's say, kids, you want to first go out and observe those kids on how they play. Let's say you want to first focus on what your age target target audience is, who's your, what's your user group, your human group that you're working with, and then design for them. And as you are coming up with solutions and ideas, these three circles, these three concentric circles on the slide help you narrow down and find that sweet spot. So when you say the sweet spot is, is it feasible, is it desirable, is it viable? Uh, feasibility, desirability, and viability test is a test of a solid human-centered uh, design. Um, now, 
I know because I've been doing this, a lot of this kind of is much more clearer in my mind, but I also understand for anyone who's just starting out, this might feel like, um, okay, so where do I start? Um, it's more, I would say, like if you are a person who before, before giving anyone a sol solution, a suggestion, thinks and understands the idea better, you are a human-centered designer. And when I say that, I mean, when I, when I come to you and I say, hey, um, my, my foot hurts, most of the times people will hand you some pills they've been eating or something, some oil that they've been using, some medicine, some lotion that they've been using, or will suggest that I, I stop running or will suggest I buy new shoes. But if you're a human-centered designer, the first thing you will do is you will come to me and ask me, what is it? What are you, get, what are you doing these days? What's happening? Tell me about your day. So uh, tell me, is there something you've changed? When did it start? So let's go back to our doctors. Like our doctors don't just prescribe. Many do. So I'm not talking about those doctors, but good doctors don't just start with like, here's the medicine, take it and go they would start talking to you. They want to understand the symptoms. They want to understand where it's coming from. Try it out. And then they'll be like, try changing. Maybe uh, then they'll suggest you something and will be like, come back to me in four days and we'll talk again. Use this and then tell me. And then when I go back to the doctor in four days, I'm like, oh, it doesn't, it still doesn't feel better. So there's another series of questions. So good doctors are trying to not just, I, not just solve the problem that they think it is, but they're trying to problem solve the problem that I have. So actually, this has been there forever. It's nothing new. It's just something old that has been packaged, right? So most of the challenge questions when it comes to design thinking are, are shaped as how might we questions. So when I say how might we question, it's like, how might we feed 9 billion people by 2050? How might we redesign this shopping cart? And the, these three words, how might we, uh, are, are really powerful. So if you're designing anything, even if you're, you're teaching in a classroom and you're like, how might we write better essays? Uh, the idea of how is your solution focused. You're not problem focused. So you're not focusing so much on the problem, you're focusing on the solution. You're focusing on improvement. Might is an optimistic and generative outlook. The word might is giving you the idea that there is a possibility that we might fail, but there's a better possibility that we might do it better. We might do it in, do it, we might come back stronger with this, with this solution. And we, is the whole idea of collective and collaboration. And when you are trying to understand the person, there are lots of tools that you can use, but the one tool that I, I personally really love using is called the empathy map. So here's like, there, there's lots of templates, but this is one template that I use with my students and uh, the teachers that I work with now. Uh, and when you do when you do empathy map, it's more like if we go back to the video, the people there when they went to uh, the grocery stores, they're looking at different behaviors. People people moving the whole cart instead of um, taking a little basket to one spot, or or trying to fit into those tiny spots, or trying to find something and somebody uh, yelling out using um, those microphones like that would like some of these ideas that they, this video is pretty dated like it's an old video uh, but some of the ideas that they were talking about <clears throat> they're now in action like i have seen shopping carts that have those uh, separate baskets to carry that i have uh, amazon in fact in us um, in chicago has a store that is completely manned by nobody. It's all technology. You take the cart, you put your stuff in it, and you just leave. 
So it reads your, so there's no person who's checking out. Your cart have been, has been automat automated. So everything that goes in the cart gets scanned in and your Amazon Prime account is charged. So that's it. Because it's it's Amazon Go, they can do it. They, ha they have all our information there, our credit card, everything is there. So there's no human and those, it's called, it's Amazon Go. And the place, it, it was interesting because the place they were testing their idea with is Whole Foods. Whole Foods is a shopping chain here. It's big uh, organic shopping and one of the most expensive uh, grocery stores, but that's owned by Amazon now. Um, and there is the Amazon Go in partnership with Whole Foods is are the people who started. And they use some of these ideas in this old, I want to say this video is at least 20 years old. Uh, because Tom Kelly, the founder, the the people who were there, I hear them now, and they're much, they look much more older. So, uh, coming back, so the empathy map is where is what these people when they were when they came back after observing in the real uh, world out there, this is what they were doing. So when they were putting sticky notes on the board on the wall, they were saying what were the things they heard. What were the behaviors, some of the behaviors they, they saw people doing? What was some of the, what did the environment look like? How were the people thinking and feeling? Like uh, when my son was little, I used to take him in those car seats and put him in the cart. And I was, I was kind of empathizing when I was watching that video because I was like, yes, I have done that. Where I've put his uh, car seat in the shopping cart, and I felt like constantly holding him as I'm shopping because I'm I'm scared this this thing is wobbly, and what if he's sleeping? But what if he wakes up and he moves around? This thing will fall off. So the exercise that they were doing on the wall with sticky notes, this was an empathy exercise, and we could do this with anyone and everyone. So when you're interviewing, I when I teach my kids how to interview, this is what I use, and I tell them. Don't create questions um, because they're teenagers. They're, they're 14, 15, 16. Um, and a lot of adults, too. We, we do that, too, a lot of times when we say, hey, you have to interview somebody. We come up with a list of questions, and it's hard to keep the conversation on for especially. I know we adults can still maneuver. But for kids, a lot of times, that is the struggle. That is the pain point because they start asking questions. And after asking a few questions, they're like, I'm done. And I have to go back and tell them, like, this person spared time. Like, you, you keep the conversation going. And how do you keep the conversation going? You pick on the pointers. You pick on what are you hearing? Uh, let's say you asked a person a question and that person stopped, like, for five minutes before answering. Not not five minutes, but let's say a few seconds before answering. You, you look at the body language and you know that person's uncomfortable asking. So don't ask that question. Or just say, let's move on um, if you're not comfortable with that. So you'd read the body language. You're, you're seeing what the person's doing. You're thinking. You're looking at everything when you're interviewing. So this empathy map kind of comes into play when all of that is happening. Um, you could use it in this template. You could just use it, the pain and gain aspect of after you came back from the interview, what were some of the pain points? What were some of the positives? What was, what is it that they're enjoying about this? What is it that they would want to change? So you're looking at both sides when you say pain and gain. And as we go on with the interview, the idea of keeping human at the center, the core, the core premise of this is staying curious. Uh, and when I say stay curious, it's about not just about like asking your set of questions or asking questions with regards to um, your topic. Sometimes it's in the side conversations that we get the most value. So if you're curious, you're picking on every cue, you're picking on every story, you're picking on every emotion. Yes, that might make your job difficult. Uh, to sh you, you, might, you might feel like, I just have to design a shopping cart. I don't care what this person, oh, no, I, I know you don't, like nobody would say I don't care, but if your questions are all about shopping cart, you're not understanding the human uh, emotions and behavior. So if I am a new mother 
and you're seeing me scared shopping with the drivers with the car seat in the shopping cart you're understanding the emotion behind it because i'm a new mom i'm supposed to be feeling that way so when i'm designing something i keep that in the back of my mind because i was curious i saw for those cues uh when you are seeing that the space is too tight and i don't know where everything is this is a new new store that i've come to shop at then again at the back of my mind it's like i don't want to let go of my cart because there are so few carts in this place you've seen those people right like they'll the like you they're struggling there are times when you're struggling to find a cart so you you kind of just hold on to your cart everywhere you go because you know you'll leave it and somebody will just come and grab it so staying curious and then these tools that you see in the slide here i i feel um these these tiny logos here they were they were designed by district c this is a district c model and district c is a place where i i'm i'm certified district c design uh, coach um they do a lot of work with students on working in groups and doing problem solving and this is one of the one of their slides and they talk about how uh when you're questioning you're listening following and being curious so these tools are mostly like dig 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 i if i if there's one thing i remember from this is dig dig for stories dig for questions why 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 so when somebody says i really like shopping uh at this store or i don't like shopping at that store you're digging why why this store why not that store oh i really like the way they're organized what what is it that you like the most oh the child the the milk section is right when i enter so i don't have to walk 100 mile to get a gallon of milk so or so you're digging why and these five whys is another technique to ask more questions and learn more about the person and i feel this is where we'll stop and the idea is empathy is a superpower like you would see people who get the most out of any any situation any conversation and are able to problem solve are the people who are most empathetic and when i say empathetic i mean empathetic and not sympathetic sympathy i feel sometimes drains us but empathy is what empowers us like having sympathy for people is a good thing but sympathy also sometimes at least it wears me out um uh, but I feel it's a superpower you can have in your in your toolkit and you can use it uh wherever you need so where and any problem as a teacher as a person in a house I use empathy for um a lot of things not always there are days I I there are days in when we have arguments as well and then that is when I'm reminded that I'm not I'm not in my zone i'm not in my empathetic zone so with that i would challenge you to go out and try and use this and this is this is not a one part series i would say uh just dig like the more you learn about it i am passionate about this idea but the more you dig into it you'll you'll see its usage in your life because i think it is applicable in all of our lives and with that thank you yes thank you thank you very much uh, megha uh, for this very insightful thoughtful and uh, informative session and i'm sure that uh, we will take couple of questions uh, i request the audience to put their questions in the chat box and uh, we'll ask those question to megha and uh, she would be happy to answer those questions but i'm really thankful for this wonderful session thank you so much once again and uh, i'd like to request the audience the members in the audience to put their questions in the chat box thank you so ashok i do see questions um yeah yeah i i'm going in. i'm trying to get those questions yes okay. just one minute 
Ashok sir, you may check the Q and A here also. There are questions posted. Okay, okay, okay. You can click on Q and A beside yeah, short. There you can find sorry, questions. So I'll check it, check it out. Yeah. So uh, there is a one question that I'd like to ask, uh, which we would like to begin with that question. This is a question from Dr. Zedin Patil, and he is asking, uh, can you offer us some examples from English language teaching domain, please? So how, how we can relate the concept of design thinking to English language teaching? Yeah. Over to you, please. Yes. So um, I, I am in... I was teaching English here at the school too. Sometimes it, it was my, my students would tell me like, your first language is not even English and you're an English teacher. And I would be like, yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it, it's funny, but but I was I am the e ELA and ELL. So it's 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 interesting because uh, I've done projects that are some of the most interesting project. So our school um, is very design focused, but it's also project based. So we don't do traditional English classes, but we do give them English credits. So in our traditional uh, English classes, what we do is we, we, we have textbooks, we read, we write, we do all of those things. But because our school is a project based school, how we use it in our projects and English um, teaching every day is we so one of the projects that I designed with my students was a children's storybook project so and when I say children's storybook I mean like little kids um, my son's age so here like it's at least if I go back to the time when I was in India I don't think there were very many good children's storybook coming from the in from India, but now there are lots of authors. There's Tulika publication. There's like all of these books that you see. But in in US, in the West, children's storybook is a different genre by itself. And it's a very big market when it comes to books. So a lot of our and a lot of kids grow up like libraries are a, are are a big thing. Going to library twice a week is a thing in, in most families. They take their kids and you can pick like not just two books, three books, but you can actually borrow like 40, 50, 100 books if you want from the library, bring them home and then give them back whenever you can kind of thing. So libraries, reading is a big thing. So kids grow up in that in those scenarios. So what we did was our one of my English projects was to, to write children's storybooks. It might seem like, oh, it's only books for little kids. But if you think about it, these books are some of the most difficult and challenging books to write because you're not writing for adults, you're writing for little kids. So what we had to do was I had to take my students to a daycare. We spent one whole day at a daycare watching these little kids uh, watching these little children read books, how, what books do they like asking? And it wasn't like, oh, so what book do you like? You couldn't, you cannot do that with three year olds, four year olds. So which is your favorite book? Sit with me and talk to me about for 20 minutes. They cannot even sit for two minutes. Right? So the idea of visiting them in a daycare setting, in a preschool setting and watching these little kids, oh, I love this book. You're reading out to them. I remember one of my students actually took a children's storybook and made a rap song out of that and was singing it to them and all the kids started dancing. So it's it's interesting because it's it's not just like, again, going back to the same thing, you're not just going going into sitting in your office and writing a book. You cannot do that. You need to know your audience. And when you do that, that is where good ideas will flow from. The student interviewed the teacher, they interviewed student, they, they not interviewed, they observed the students, little kids playing. They even went out. You might think like, why are you going out in, on the playground with these kids when your idea is to write a book? You need to know what are the things they're fascinated about. They saw bugs 
and they were jumping there's a there's a bug here there's a bug here so that becomes you know how kids are interested in a cockroach <laughs> so they're they're like fascinated picking up a cockroach and you know you could write a book about that topic or kids love playing in the sand so that's giving you the idea like sand is something you can write about so that was one of the ways we used the idea of human centeredness in our english project uh, the other project that I did was a bread, I call it breaking bread project. Um, it was one of my favorite projects because <clears throat> what we did was we talked about breads from different parts of the world, not just uh, US, not just India. So we were talking because I like I even made some breads. I made some parathas at home and I took it to my classroom and my kids ate it. I took like alu paratha, I had like gobi paratha, all of those and I made like plain uh, bajra roti and all of those. And some kids brought their own breads as well. And we shared food. We talked about the society. We talked about how eating habits sh shape us, how what we eat is based on the geography where we grow up. Um, like, like I said, I was raised in Delhi and I studied in Hyderabad. So I've kind of had experience with North and South and I realized how north is so wheat focused and south is more rice because it's not because they cannot eat wheat it's because it grows rice grows more in the south than in the north so it's our geographies it's our cult it's that is what defines our eating habits as well so there was so much social science in the idea of just bread just learning about breads and and not food in general so that is where I think I was able to incorporate a lot of these human centered ideas into my English classroom. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for very elaborate and uh, detailed answer to this question. So here I'd like to ask another question from uh, Gurapu Damodar. And the question is uh, like shopping behavior is changing very fast. Everything is going online. Like empathy experience is absent. So in such scenario, what will be the fate of conventional establishment that cater to the needs of illiterates with empathy? So that's 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 a challenge question. We should try solving that using design process, right? We should we should probably uh, I I have my one of my very good friends here. He he works at a grocery store um, and we talk about this a whole lot like He's been at this grocery store for the last 20 years. And I was asking him like, with this new style of stores coming up and people shopping online, is he scared about his job? And he said, yes. So uh, people are scared um, because he's only done that for the last 20 years. He says he doesn't know what he'll do, uh, what else he could do. So I think we should use our design process to ask kind of inquire deeper into this question and uh, learn more about these people, why it's changing and what are the alternatives. And I think if you, if I am not going to give an answer here, but if you look deeper into this, the solution, the behaviors as they're changing, if online shopping is growing, home deliveries are also growing, right? So there's always, something one if one industry rises it feeds into the other sector so there's i don't think we have anything to fear um it'll just change it, it's that's what evolution is yes thank you very much uh, we'll take one or two last questions and uh, we have a question from arvindan he's asking uh, are the present existing education systems in india and the USA and the world at large following human centered design? Oh, if we were doing that, we would be, I think this world would be a different world, but we're not doing it. <laughs> so, and even in, in the country, I would say ours is one of the few schools who's trying to do that. Uh, our education is still way industrial age um still catering to grades and even if we try and to change high school there are universities that are that are asking for entrance exams there are universities asking for 
SATs, ACTs, GREs, all of those exams and scores. So I think the education system needs to do this, but I like that we've at least started thinking about it. Like if I am doing this at a high school, I'm proud that we are doing it at the high school level. Um, I I would love it if we can, like, I think we need to start earlier, like start, go back to elementary school, start teaching kids about this, even there, um, like elementary, middle, high, go to university. But again, we are far from this being, uh, far from me saying, that we are largely following this model. I would say this is just drop in the ocean. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Megha, for answering this question. I can see a lot of questions uh, in the chat box, anyone in Q&A section, uh, questions from Rahul Kale, from then uh, we have question from Laba Singh, and uh, we also have question from Lawrence and uh, Joshi, but we have so I, I I want to take like this one question um, yeah. which is about how is design used in ESL EFL teaching I think Arvindan is the one asking this question yeah, yeah. so I I think when I say empathy or human is at the heart of design um, the whole idea of ESL is human like you're teaching people who ha who don't know the language, but they're adult learners most of the times, right? With little kids, we don't say ESL. Like my son is not an ESL learner. He was born here. So he for him, English is, I would say mostly, like he speaks more English than he does Hindi. I tried teaching him Hindi. He can understand every word of it, but he's been going to preschool daycare since he was like six months, he's been out. So he's, he spends more time with English speakers than at home. So, um, but so what I was saying, like with the kids, you don't say it's ESL. Mostly ESL, EFL is with adult learners. So when you say, uh, how do we use the design process with them? I think the first idea is to understand that they speak a language that is different than English and they're learning it, they're learning, like, I, I think there's lots of theory behind, like, L1 is an asset and not a liability, like, using your first language, like, I, it, it sounds cheesy, but I've heard it, like, if you see somebody speaking broken English, you should know that they, you should, you should know that they speak another language. So that, like, we, we usually laugh at people like I, I, I when I started teaching a lot of my students, I, they still do it because teenagers, I think high school, high schoolers are the most <laughs> in your face kind of kids. They tell you they would laugh some, at some of the words that I would say, the, the way I would talk, like the accent that I had. And I would be like, now I'm like, I wasn't born here and I can speak three languages. Can you? So I kind of like just put it back in their faces. But when you when you when you know an ESL EFL speaker, you also know that they speak other languages and use that as the center of their learning. They've had experiences. So as an ESL teacher, you would use the experiences that they come from, they, they come with and use those to teach. So if there is a speaker that you have, uh, like when I was teaching in New York, I, I was teaching adults and I had these Spanish speaking students and some of those were like servers at a restaurant. So we would use restaurant scenarios quite a lot with them than anything else because they were more aware of that situation. So those that vocabulary, that language came easy to them. So using that scenario to get them better at English was better than um, anything else. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, probably this would be the last question from my side. In fact, we have covered the topic in detail, but however, I'd like to ask, like, could you please uh, tell us some examples how uh, the entire design thinking or human-centered process has uh, impacted uh, learning scenarios for you and at your school. So could you uh, speak a little bit more about it? Um, 
so i think because we are project based we are able to use this use this process much more in a very different way than uh, a non project based school would be able to do it but if i i'm just trying in my mind going back to a traditional school if i were teaching in a traditional school let's say as an english teacher i'm trying to teach them argumentative writing so if that's the topic that i want to teach my i don't know i i think argumentative writing could be at the college level high school level even at middle school level i think we could teach it so if you're teaching argumentative writing and you have this design process uh, as a tool in your tool set what you would do is you would uh, i would take them out maybe hear some watch some videos go out talk to some lawyers who use argumentative writing in their day to day basis so like they they do argument like maybe bring a lawyer as an expert and talk to him or her about how he or she designs uh, their arguments in the court because you're looking at real life application and one of the things that i love about our school and the way we designed it is we and we don't call ourselves teachers we call ourselves coaches so like i am coach mega that's my name so i go by my my kids call me coach mega so coaches are different from teachers coaches the job is to poke like just poke the raft they like, keep the raft afloat not let these kids but and but that makes me that the one other thing that it brings to for is i am not the expert in the room i will help you learn but i'm not the expert i am an english teacher i have a degree i have all of that but i don't have all the answers let's find it out together so when you go with that approach you attack the problem dif- differently than when when you're the expert in the room so when i'm teaching argumentative writing why learn from me why not learn from a person who uses argumentative writing every day to make a living and that person is a lawyer bring a lawyer into the classroom and teach them about argumentative writing and how he or she is designing his or her arguments every day so that is where i think the power comes into play and that is where we can we can change education and make it if you're learning let's say you want to write um a persuasive piece of writing persuasive writing again is more like you're trying to convince somebody so why not bring a person who 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 writes who who helps with political campaigns why vote for one person and not vote for the other person they design these lofty campaigns they they do radio ads tv ads all of that everything is focused i know we all know people so what we need to do as education institutions is open the doors not keep the do- gates shut open the gates and bring people in the society the community wants to engage with students just open the doors and bring people in and let let our students interact with them and you be the facilitator you be what you're ashok what you're doing right now be the moderator uh that doesn't mean you're you're less of a teacher i think you're more of a teacher when you engage with more people thank you thank you very much uh, for this answer thank you so much in fact uh, this approach to problem solving is very valuable and which prepares us to solve meaningful challenges in the world and all the problems probably we can say and uh, design thinking is definitely creative art and human centered collaborative method that definitely requires the capacity to reason in an empathetic way to understand other people's behavior to imagine creative solutions and to taste and evaluate them we surely look forward to applying these learnings and takeaways in our day to day activities and even in english language teaching thank you mega for your time and expertise and the session that you delivered now definitely it will help us to generate innovative ideas and uh, which will help us to equip with the experts practices and technologies to turn those ideas into product or maybe the business values that we pr- probably have in future so thank you very much and uh, i'd like to take few moments to propose out of thanks i am thankful to mega 
for this uh, very thoughtful session, making this entire webinar effective and interactive by answering all the questions. I thank all the office uh, bearers of LTI India, uh, LTI Pune chapter, all the members of the organizing committee. I'm thankful for the technical support provided for this webinar. I thank Dr. Reddy for uh, the host of today's webinar. I'm grateful to all the distinguished members uh, in the audience. With this, I hand over the session to Dr. Reddy. So please, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashok, and uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mega Ganeju. And th that was a wonderful session. Both of you, thank you very much on behalf of Health Tribe for your uh, services for today. And dear participants, uh, I'm here to announce the next week's webinar. We have a uh, 91st webinar session on the next Sunday at 4.30 p.m. on uh, strategies for student success in English language learning. We have resource person, Ms. Priyanka Bhatkoti, who is working as the principal, Max Ford School, Dwarka, New Delhi. And we have uh, uh, Ms. Deepika Sharma to moderate the session on that day, who is a headmistress, senior secondary school, Max Ford School, Dwarka, New Delhi. We request uh, all the participants uh, to join us next Sunday at 4.30 and make it a grand success. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Signing off. Good Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mega. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Everyone. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all.